I really love this subject of desire transposed onto determinism. Um, a lot of really neat ideas got bandied around yesterday, different points of view. Um, uh, this video may end up being something of a stream of consciousness, somewhat disjoint, but then again, how <laughs> many of my videos aren't? Um, Pyro left a couple of comments on my video and on Professor Antone's video that fascinated me, where he sort of says it's just information. Whatever is going on is just information. Now, that's interesting. Um, what is information, however? Um, say we have the we have the information kind of an information stream as you see in the matrix. You know those green binary things going down this, the black screen. Um, sort of a parody, I guess, of the person who's glued to his uh, computer screen all day long. That's his reality now. Is what he sees on the screen. You know, people. You know, he sits on his screen at home. Then he gets on the bus to go to work and or the subway or whatever and looks at his screen all day. Then he, when he goes to work, he's got an office with a screen in front of him, and you know it's there's always a screen there. Um, sort of a metaphor for I guess perhaps the wheel of existence or uh, even implying that we're already in the matrix, um, and not just we're not just in the matrix in terms of being in a hollow deck. We're actually consciously opting to step into the matrix every time we look at the screen we want to go in. Instead of plugging something into the back of our heads, we're using our eyes and ears, and pss, there we go. It's just a matter of time before we are able to plug things into our heads. Um, now, Pyro implied, or if I read you correctly, Pyro, um, that we're just receiving information. That's kind of all that's taking place. If, if I've got you wrong, correct me. Um, <clears throat> I would say that that's an incomplete view of, say, what would you call it? Reality, I suppose. Um, because, as I say, desire goes out into the causal chain. Uh, a good illustration of that is the Bhagavad Gita, my the thing that I always bring up here. The story is basically what happens when the causal chain goes really bad. Uh, when events take turns that you can't control and things get really horrible. Um, the everyman, Prince Arjuna, finds himself in, in his own personal nightmare scenario where things are just so screwed up that he can't imagine how he can ever cope with it all. He just collapses. Uh, long and the short, he's a warrior. Warriors are bound by this very rigid code of loyalty and duty and everything like this, and loyalty and duty and everything is all clashing at once because he's found himself at war with his friends, relatives, teachers, everything. Um, his duty says one thing, his loyalty to these people says another. Uh, his sense of compassion clashes with his warrior vocation, etc. Everything is just horrible. Um, I've illustrated it in many different ways over the years uh, in my videos and uh, it's just what happens when things get completely out of hand where you really you know I, I'm always talking about how you should ride the tiger um, and um, Arjuna has just basically I guess fallen off the tiger and the tiger is turning around and about to leap on him <laughs> um, very nice. But again, that's the whole point. That's the despondency of Arjuna. That sets the stage for the entire Gita, essentially. And Krishna essentially says, okay, first of all, this battle is going to happen with or without you. It, it doesn't, your, your input is not required. You know, um, your liking it or not liking it is not required. Um, you know, it's sort of a nod to causality, right? There's, you know, things are just going to pan out the way they're going to pan out. What difference does it make? Or, you know, it, it's not even what difference does it make. It doesn't make any difference. He's not even asking it rhetorically. He's saying it, it's irrelevant what you think. But, Arjuna, says Krishna, God, it matters to you, doesn't it? Huh? <laughs> no, it matters to you uh, what's going on out here. So let me show you how to get back onto that tiger. Or, 
in another way of looking at it, step back from the whole thing to be in the battle, but not of the battle, that kind of thing. Um, first of all, he shows him what the causal chain actually is. Uh, that's the Vishvarupa. That's the, the universal vision. Basically, it's Krishna telescopes the entire causal chain into one split second and blasts Arjuna's brain with it, where he sees everything. <laughs> um, he's, it's the, the universal vision, where he sees the entire causal chain play itself out before his very eyes all at once and every conceivable possibility in every possible universe all at once. More than human perception can handle, of course. Arjuna is almost killed by this, by the way. He's almost driven out of his mind. Um, but, um, you know, it's kind of, as I say, it's, it's existential panic, I guess, when you're suddenly confronted with your own existence. You know, it's the same thing as the, the scene from The Last Messiah, where um, the caveman gets blasted by something similar, some... Uh, unity of everything, a unity that is somehow perverse, um, somehow terrifying, horrifying even, lethal. Kills him, of course. Almost kills Arjuna, but doesn't. Then Krishna says there, now that you've seen basically everything, the universe, and that's a line from the, you know, he goes, behold Arjuna, this is the universe, everything. Wham! Hits him right between the eyes. I think that you can actually do that in a determined universe because identity vanishes because nothing is stable long enough to be called a particular thing. Everything is sort of morphing from one thing to a to another. It's you know like that boat thing. When does a, a boat that you repair stop being what it originally was? That kind of thing. Nothing is ever stable long enough to be considered a thing unless something outside of it puts identity upon it. Um, so I was talking to. Um, Stefano Disanayake yesterday, and I, and I was using a, the metaphor of a, of a uh, beach, and let's just say the universe is this beach with grains of sand, and things just keep getting made out of this sand, and they come and they go, and they come and they go, and they come and they go. Um, it's all just sand. Um, that's implied in, in determinism, I think. Um, everything just sort of comes and goes, and ultimately it's just stuff, I guess you'd call it matter, that um, causes things to come and go, and, and these forms to appear, and uh, ultimately these forms are not stable long enough to really mean anything. Um, I'm you know, obviously not <laughs> a Platonist. Um, and the... Um, the issue here is, it doesn't really matter what forms things take, or what apparent forms things take. The causal chain, you might as well telescope it to a split second, as they do in the Gita, because nothing is stable long enough. Just take the causal chain and telescope it into just one split second, um, and then, once you've done that, look at the universe that way. <laughs> um, Something caused the universe to come and to go. Okay, um, something set the whole thing in motion. Um, then, of course, <laughs> the Gita gets even bigger and says, as Pyro said, Vishnu was just sort of having brain farts. That's universes kept coming out of his own head. You know, the causal chain starts over and over and over, and it just gets into larger and larger causal chains and everything. Um, and you kind of get lost in the sheer immensity of it all. And again, that, the, the, these metaphors are deliberately chosen, of course, for that. You're supposed to get lost and disoriented. It is disoriented. Now, um, but that's not the entire story. Um, at the beginning, Arjuna doesn't care if he lives or if he dies. It doesn't matter to him. He says, what am I in the face of all of this? And Krishna basically says, you're the other half of the equation here. You are just as important as all this stuff that you perceive. Because for in, in order for any of it to be real, it has to be perceived by you. So you are kind of one half of everything. It kind of fits neatly in with a lot of dualistic views of, of the universe. Um, Jainism has that kind of view of things, 
where there's, you know, all that there is in the universe is jiva, which is loosely translated as soul, I call it perception, um, and ajiva, which is that which is perceived, or prakriti purusha in tantra or vedanta or whatever, um, the wheel of existence, versus that which is per perceiving the wheel of existence. Uh, in the Jain view of things, the wheel of existence never started to turn and it will never stop. It just is. Um, <clears throat> even if you don't know what isness is, the wheel of existence just is. That's that. Uh, that's the Jain view of things, um, <laughs> in a real nutshell. Um, but again, the Jains also posit the view that the wheel of existence all of its effect on us, all of its effects on us are ultimately negative. It's an onerous thing. It's Sisyphean. It's, um, it's re it, re it repeats itself ad nauseum, ad infinitum, over and over again, forever and ever and ever and ever, ever. <laughs> um, and, okay, why should that brute fact seem terrifying to us. Well, it is terrifying to us. It apparently killed Zafi's caveman. Almost drew, drove Arjuna out of his mind or killed him. Somehow, we have to cope with that thing called the causal chain. Because we have desires relative to it. We want it to be a certain way. We want it to satisfy us not to frustrate us. We want it to feel good, not to feel bad. We want it to, um, or at least our interactions with it, to feel good and not to feel bad. We want our, um, we don't want to suffer, or perhaps we do want to suffer, but we want to suffer in a certain way, not in another way. We want our suffering to actually mean something to us, not just pointless torture. We want something out of it, or we want our interaction with the causal chain to be a certain way. Now you can say that I'm using things like we when there is no identity here. Okay, I, I understand that. I get it. And, I, and you just be careful with what you think I mean when I say we. Whatever is on the receiving end of all the perceptions, whatever perceives that, that which is perceived is what I refer to as the we here. Um, I was talking to Artificer yesterday and I said, how about errors? Do errors exist? He said, yes. I said, okay, whatever is making errors is what I refer to as we. And he explained, well, you know, errors can be explained sort of causally. And I said, yeah, I understand that, but something has to make an error in order for it to be an error. If it's not making an error, then it isn't an error. <laughs> you know, the, it's the old thing about how do you, how do you get an error in the causal chain? Um, it, uh, it, it's not that I'm saying that I exist as such. It's not that. I'm just saying that something perceives that which is perceived. Pyro says we're in an information stream. Information to be information must inform something. What is it informing? Whatever that is, is, is we. So, or, you know, let's go back to suffering. Whatever is suffering is that which I refer to as we. That which suffers. <clears throat> um... We don't want things to work out in a certain way, and we want them to work out in a certain way, or we at least want our perceptions to be, to go a certain way, and we don't want our perceptions to go other ways. Now, that's kind of the paradox in the entire thing. Why should Arjuna despair at the beginning of the opening chapter of the Gita? Why should he care? Krishna is saying that it doesn't matter if you despair or not. <laughs> the universe is just going to keep happening. You can't stop it. Um, you know, it's the you know you you can't stop the wheel of existence. You can't stop the causal chain. It's just going to keep going. It, the universe is just going to keep universing. Um, the, you you might as well step in front of a freight train and say, "Stop, please." You know, it, 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 even that is. No, you're not even getting close to how pitiful any attempt to control the causal chain would be. Um, but again, the causal chain leaves marks on us. Leaves marks on what? Well, it leaves marks on whatever suffers. That which suffers, the suffering builds up, right? 
<laughs> I don't think anybody would deny that, oh, although I'd love to hear somebody say that. Um, the more you suffer, the you know the Hindus would say the more negative karma you've got on yourself or whatever. I don't know. I don't want to get into that, but so if suffering leaves marks upon you. Uh, positive experiences leave marks upon you, and and the Gita warns you that the positive ones can be just as big of a snare as the as the negative ones, and the negative ones might not be all that negative. And then when you take a big picture view of things, but one way or another, the causal chain has to be coped with because it your perception of it can seriously well i don't know how, to, how else to put it but it can seriously fuck you up <laughs> um, you have to cope with this with this mess that we call existence what are you going to do about it um i always talk about existential panic i think existential panic is when you you're suddenly confronted with the stark brute fact of your own existence encased in this massive thing called existence you know nausea huh. um, you, you, you're sort of blown away by it just the fact of existing has effects now other people say isn't exist, is existence wonderful I, I sort of follow roughly a kind of a set of psychological I guess practices or philosophical practices or mental practices whatever you want that are aimed at making you like or enjoy and truly enjoy the um, uh, your interactions with the causal chain. It's called Tantra. It's pretty much the exact opposite of Jainism. Jainism says, here's how you get off the causal chain, you get out of it. And Tantra says, here's how you have the most fun while you're in it, or the most enjoyment. Um, Tantra emphasizes, at bottom, love. And um, Jainism emphasizes, at bottom, withdrawal. Now, love is active. Withdrawal is not, although one could say it is. <laughs> you know, it depends. But, it, you know, they're kind of polar polarities here in how you deal with the, the causal chain. There are other ways, of course. You can deal with it the way Arjuna did and get completely wiped out by it and crushed under the wheel of existence and just scream and yell forever if you... You know, but again, the Gita says uh, ultimately it's up to you how you choose to relate to this. But it just is. Um, it's neither good nor bad. It's just that's just the way things are. Um, so I think that it's not accurate to say that um, the wheel of existence or the causal chain or the information stream is just a one-way street that we're just sitting here looking at things happening. You might be able to say that, yes, whatever our value states are, or whatever effect the wheel of existence has on us, or, you know, the causal chain, or whatever you want to call it. I'm just using metaphors here. Um, and please, all the stuff that I've used in this video, all metaphor. Um, I don't believe anything. Um, We do, actually, it, it does affect us. The causal chain affects us. If it didn't, there would be no such thing as suffering, right? Um, we are subjected to it. Something is subjected to it. You know, um, Something is perceiving all of this. And the act of perceiving it, I think, in a sense, changes it. It might not change the mechanics of it, but it changes the way in which it affects us. You can learn to cope with it. There's simply too much evidence to that effect that some people seem to be okay with the causal chain and some people don't seem to be okay with it at all. Um, how do we account for that difference? Desire again, right? 